I'm going to talk about um, a project that we started in 1970, uh, looking at lava flows on the Big Island. So, and that's the sound of a lava flow going down the street. <laughs> another slope. Yeah, You'll see some photos of that too. But it does sound like that underwater, the lava flows. <laughs> so anyway, um, there was a team of us. It was kind of a shoestring operation. Uh, we didn't really have a boat for most of the time. And um, when, we, when we did our surveys, we basically just went offshore to surf and where, where, where we could do. And we tried to go through, find all of the lava flows over the last century that were dated and we knew where they were. And then the other thing that I, that I did was uh, I worked on two boat harbors. And the difference here is that the lava flows were all at different times. So the lava flow is a different strategy. We were able to visit, put permanent transects down and visit it over time. So we're actually in the same habitat. So what I was talking about, so we basically visited seven dated lava flows. We, we looked for them. One of them didn't work out because we couldn't distinguish the, the control site and the lava on the, on the flow sites. And then we also examined a, uh, a flow that was going into the ocean at the time we were looking at it, which uh, we'll talk about at the end of the, the, the um, talk, and then two, the, the two boat harbors. And these are the calculations that we looked at, the area. We converted uh, length of uh, corals within a quadrat and convert it to area, and then we also collected information on the data of, of the, the species, and then from there we tried to look at a number of things, a number of species, you know, uh, species uh, per site, uh, coral abundance, uh, and as well as a Shannon Weaver index of um, diversity and evenness. These are all pretty well known now. And these were all the sites are located. Uh, the, the, the top three on the, on the left side are the two boat harbors and Kiholo. And then where we actually succeeded in doing the surveys were down at the, the south end around to the Puna side on the east coast. So these are the two boat harbors and Kiholo. And uh, it was great. Well, it's too bad we didn't have GPS and Google Earth because it's really easy to see the, the lava flows now compared to where we, what we had working for us 43 years ago when we started the survey. But this is Kiholo, and I hope that some, some, at some point, this is the oldest dated lava flow we have on the island, Kiholo. And I think we could probably go and do a survey there at some point, and somebody will do it. And it would be important because it's the oldest one. So these are the, the down at the southern end of Kona. And there's three flows that we looked at there, the 50, 1950, 1926, and 19, 1868 flows. And on the Puna Ka'u side, we had um, the 1955, uh, 1960. 1970, 72 lava flows, a live one, and, uh, and then the other one down there. So this is the, the youngest flow that we looked at. So we, we went in the, uh, we went to the site, and we established both a, what we call a control site or a reference site where there wasn't a flow, and then on the flow itself and, and make uh, um, comparisons between the two. And this is some of the photos we took. After just one year, there's not much that you can see as far as corals because they're too small. There's probably corals in the photo. And uh, so a couple of them are here. This is the Paradis compressor coral that somehow was, has grown pretty quick, quickly in that one period, one year period. And there's a small um, coral of Postlopora. And over here is a lot of algae, um, crime, um, moss animals, uh, all kinds of stuff. So not much coral after one year. What was interesting, though, is that the, 
the flow went around a lot of islands of, li of the living corals, and they were not destroyed. In fact, the, the lava flow basically disintegrated into um, black sand. But yet, uh, the, the other corals were alive. So they seem to cool off pretty fast when the flows come down, they, they, they cooled off. And this is showing, again, another 1969 lava flow a year later. So that was a pretty good size uh, fossil for it there. Now this is really interesting. So here's a lava flow coming down the slope. And right next to it are, are the Springer corals, right? They compress it, and they were not affected. So basically, they, they just, they're, they're in a flow mode, and then all of a sudden they freeze, and they're not hot anymore because the water pretty much uh, cools them off really quickly. And again, islands, uh, sand being pulverized, I mean, uh, the uh, flow being pulverized. So basically there was, as you can see from this site, there wasn't a whole lot of corals com at the lava site compared to the control site. Hardly any. And, you know, there was 33% on the control site here. Okay, so the second youngest flow was the Kapoho 1960 flow. Now, we couldn't get a boat there because it was too rough. So we had to basically take all of our gear and walk through the surf to get to the site out here. And I got knocked down three times. It was really something. But we managed to get out to the flow. And so this Kapoho flow was a huge flow. It actually changed quite a bit the island area. There was a town there that disappeared at the time. So, so this, at that time, this would be a 10-year-old flow. And you can see that the uh, Pasolopora is pretty big here. And this is how, it was a lot of turbidity in the, um, at the site, maybe because there was a disintegration of the lava. And so you can see how we're doing this. We use a, a ruler. Rick Greg would be putting his finger on the length of it, and then I would write down the, the, the species and the, and, and the data. So this is how we did it, two people. So this is showing what the, uh, the Kapoho site looked like after 10 years. It's pretty rough and ready, and a lot of turbidity in the, in the air. And that's me on the, on the left side. And you can see we had pretty primitive um, scuba deer at that time. They didn't invent BCs. We didn't have computers. And we just had finally got pressure gauges. But that time, before that, we had these little things, these levers that went up and down. So, it was pretty dicey in, in the good old days. So this is 1960. You can see that there's a mixed uh, um, varieties as well as uh, Oscillopora. So quite a bit of uh, coral cover here. And, but it's still, percent cover is only 1%. And I think one of the reasons in this case is that it's such hard surf that pretty much controls not only what's on the lava flow, but on the, on the control sites. So it was really a heavy duty wave controlled area. And so there wasn't that much in the way of development of corals. So then they went to the Kahena 1955 lava flow. Now we're behind the, the trade winds. And so we're in a more calm place. 1955. And unfortunately, we couldn't uh, jump off this cliff and get into the, the water, so we had a boat, thank God, for this site. And you can see there's a lot more coral cover here. It's unbelievable. And this is only 15 years after the flow, and a tremendous amount of Pasopora and also parietes. This is on the flow. And this is me, uh, uh, Sid Townsley was the third member of the team that was also um, on the team and taking, mostly taking photos. And this is the lava flow from the, that coming off of the shoreline into the deep water, this photo here. Again, and what's interesting here is that the, the fossil core are evenly distributed. You know, and thinking that the trapezia corals that try to maintain this are, were already there in, uh, on these on these corals. So now we're, we're in a situation where the percent covers are almost the same after 15 years. And also there was one 
one of the corals are actually more, two of the corals are actually more abundant, Fossiliform Andrina on the flow, and Montipro flavolata. Both of those were higher on the, the flow than they were on the control side. So now we're moving to Popokena. This is a 1950 flow. This is from Mauna Loa, and there were three forks of the, of the, uh, the, of the flow, and we picked the middle one. So this is the middle flow is the biggest one. And, but there were two others, and it would be good if somebody, when we come, somebody come back and do the survey again, to actually look at all three flows because it's a great opportunity to, to, to see the variation between the three. So here we got um, not so much high, even though we're on the lee side of the cone side, there still wasn't a lot of coral cover here. We didn't have an explanation as to why, but you still you can see the percent cover is still higher on the control site compared to the lava site, but there were higher levels of Fossilophora and uh, Latastria. So Mililii, now this is uh, further down on the Kona coast. It's a, also a site of an ancient Hawaiian village. It's still there. Fantastic lava flow. And as you can see, now that we're looking at it at the time, that would be a 44-year-old lava flow here. And you can see Montipra Capitata is huge. It has a, a, a variety of compressa. These are kind of climax species. And they tend to monopolize the, the, the bottom. And so it's a, it was, this is a, the, we were hoping to find something like this. And it was pretty similar to the control site. And here's Prides lobata. And then there's some places where you had uh, Pasilphora. As other corals. So this is a pretty, pretty spectacular spot. A lot of variation in the habitat. Again, this is a, just showing the degree of coral cover after just uh, 44 years. So now, if we look at the percent cover, the control site is still higher than the lava flow site, but the lava flow site is pretty spec is pretty substantial, and you can see the the variety of corals that are on the control site, and there's still quite a few, but not as many on the flow site. Three of the corals, though, fossil Meandrina, Montipra capitata, and Montipra patula, were all higher on the lava flow compared to the control site. So the, low, the last one here is uh, Waya Bukini, 1868 lava flow. And it was a really interesting place because right at that spot, there's a staircase, um, fl the flow is on a staircase, and it looks like there's, it's on a fault zone or something. Every so many years, it drops, the sea level drops, and it creates another place where the waves can, can create a, another uh, flat place. So it was very strange. <clears throat> this is the site of where we came in the water. We had to take a jeep to get down here. And then we just went, went off from this spot right here. But we didn't get very many good photos. My camera went mocky. And as a result, um, we tried to go back again, but we got distracted and we never were able to get back and do this. Get some good photos there. But, um, as you can see, it's pretty similar, the, the percent coral cover, but there are now more sites on the lava flow compared to the control site. And especially Parides lobata is really much higher on the lava site. So this is um, now just a summary tables here. Uh, this shows the, you know, the number of the species from the but the youngest to oldest sites at both the control site and the lava site. What's interesting, the number of coral species goes up on all of the sites, the lava flow sites. But at the control sites, there's a peak at about 44 years and drops down again. And, part, and that might be partially due to the fact that on that 44 site, there was high coral cover that outcompetes other smaller corals, and that reduces the the number of species. Now this is the, the total coral cover. In all cases, there was still more coral cover on the control sites than on the 
lava flow sites. So it still takes more time to, to reach a, the point of, of equilibrium here, not even for 100 years. And I wanted just to point out another thing, Possiliformia andrea seems to be a different type of coral. It's sort of a pioneer species in that they put out a lot more larvae in the beginning, <coughs> they're branching, but they have a limited or determinate growth. So they don't grow about 40 centimeters, but it gives them the advantage of getting there first and, and even hanging on after the other larger corals show up. And this is the Shannon Weaver index. Pretty much ma ma um, follows uh, the, the species uh, richness on the sites. Again, there's a, a drop towards the end here, probably due to com competition between the different species of coral. And this is the succession. So what we have here is Possilopora on the log flow. It's the first to get there. And it maintains itself, it goes to the peak, and when the other corals start getting more abundant, it still drops, but doesn't drop all the way down like a pioneer species. And then after that, you can see Parietes takes off, and that's the dominant coral on the lava flows, but it drops because of other factors such as wave action. And then Montipper shows up later on, and then all the rest of them show up later on. So you can see the succession here. Some of the corals never get there and it takes a time and, and, and especially Montipera doesn't get there right away and makes it make a make, makes a name for itself so to speak. Okay so that's pretty much for the lava flows. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the boat harbors. This is Honokahau Boat Harbor which is as you can see it was an inland harbor so it created new habitat that was lava. Except it wasn't a lava flow, it was dredged that way. And unfortunately, they expanded the harbor in 1968. This is the original harbor. I wish it had stayed that way because then it made a change because there was a change in the environment halfway through the study. So, what we did here in this case, I, I surveyed this harbor six times over a 20 year period. And I wanted to do it again, but I just ran out of time, I guess, time to move on. But I wanted to do another survey, say, of 30 years, or actually 40 years. So that would be a good thing to do. So perfect site to be looking at. So this is the, this is the one year period. There's nothing that you can see much in terms, maybe 100 small corals in the entire harbor after one year. And then if you look at the in 1973, which is three years after it was constructed, you're starting to get corals. That's a Montipera coral there. And then by 1976, they're getting pretty big. Apostolopora mandrina. And this is 1981, so that's uh, 11 years. So these, again, some more 11-year uh, uh, photos and more fish. And there were other people studying these other in invertebrates and corals, I mean, and, uh, and, and fish. So this is the 1991, and it's unbelievable. The coral cover is just it's a massive. And um, so it was, in that period, 20 years, it was growing pretty quickly. And the advantage of being in the harbor in this case is that you're not getting the wave action. You're not getting the northwest swells because it's on the windward side. And it's really good, clean, it's a pretty clean harbor. So this is uh, just uh, a relative abundance of corals because it's hard to, to es estimate the total amount. So again, the same patterns. You've got Possilpora starting high, but because of the, what I feel, the, the construction change that was in the middle of the, the survey did affect the, the Possilpora. It's more sensitive to the sedimentation and that's probably why it plummeted more than it did on the lava flows. And then as you can see, the other corals, uh, uh, same pattern, not much. And so there is some commonality here. And this is the Shannon Weaver index. Um, so it went up steadily. And in terms of coral cover and the diversity index didn't do that much of a, a change a little bit of a peak, so it's not quite the same as on the lava flows. 
So the other, the last, the, the last um, harbor I looked at, I didn't do a real detailed survey here. It was built in 1960. It's on the northwest side of the, of the Big Island. And when I went there in 1969, which was nine years, there wasn't much happening in the harbor. But I went back in 1991, it was unbelievable. There was a huge coral reef there. It was totally a um, climax community level place. And I think the reason why is that the harbor itself protected the corals from the northwest swell. Otherwise, when you go outside, there's hardly any corals. And the other thing, it brought the fish. So it was a really spectacular uh, to see this. I, so I really didn't do any surveys, but you could just tell from the, the, the degree of um, the development, it was pretty spectacular. So OK, so the last thing I want to talk about here is diving on a live lava flow. And um, so we were there during the eruption at the Halima'o Ma'u eruption in 1962, 72. This is where, the, where we were at. And I want to mention since 1969, 1970, it's been continually erupting. So for 40 something years, it's not, it has not stopped erupting. And so it's hard to figure out, if you're going to come back and do surveys here, it's going to be difficult to figure out who's on first and, and you know, as far as which is the older ones and the younger ones. But still, it was a, an incredible thing that's going on there. So the way we did this, you know, when you're young and uh, you're, you're immortal. So what we did is we went down to about 30, 40 feet off the flow. And we know that what's happening when the lava comes down the slope, it heats up and the hot water goes up to the surface. So as long as you don't have to go up at the lava flow, you're OK. But, so, but again, we had pressure gauges, and that was really important. I wasn't going to go without that. So we know when time to, to, to go. So this is some of the photos that were taken during the, the 2000, I mean, uh, 1972. There was glows, and it's pillow lavas, and they're going down the slope. And it's this huge talus slope of all these pillow lavas going down hundreds of feet on its maximum angle of repose when we were there. I mean, it was just a huge cliff, and we couldn't see the bottom. But the thing that was spectacular was the noise. So I hope that at some point somebody gets a good microphone, and the noise is incredible. You can feel the, the hissing and cracks and pops and explosions. It hits your lungs. You can feel it. And it's just, it was just a, something that I would never forget. And I, it would just be great if somebody could, if they're crazy enough to go back out there and, and do these surveys. But you can see here that here's this one is exploding here, and you see the bubbles coming off. This one's just heading straight down the slope on the talus slope, and this one's also starting to erupt here. And this one, you can see a big bubble, so that's the gas coming off the, as it interacts with the. Uh, so we're about 30, 35, 40 feet. And you can see the glow, and the glow will last maybe up to 30, 30 seconds or more. And then we had cocky guys, you know, they want to come over right over there and touch it and see if it hurts. <laughs> I'm not going to mention any names, but that's not me there. <laughs> Craziness. So this is uh, one part of the flow. So this is what's interesting here. It's covering a younger, a older flow is being covered by a, a lava here. So. So, so look, we made a couple of more dives. So this is the last dive I made here. We got a little cocky again. We wanted to get closer to the flow to get a close of it, you know, going into the water. So here we are, and we're getting a little bit closer. And we're very close, and it's very warm there. And the engine burned up on the boat. So we had 16. 16 foot Boston Whaler had a little kicker on it, a 20 horsepower. It didn't, it didn't go dead. So we, fortunately, the wind was offshore. And what we did, it was going three knots. We had to go all the way to Pohuiki, which was 35 miles away. So when we went past Kaimu Beach and Kalapana, 
two of these guys put a tank on their back, one around their arm. We had, we had uh, ten tanks and four people, and, went, and so what happened was we were able to lighten the boat, and it went up all the way up to five knots. And it took us eight and a half hours to get to Fort Wiki, and nothing bad happened, thank God. So, one other thing that's really important, that talus slope that I mentioned before, 20 years later, there were six people on that flow, and it cut loose. It slid down the slope, and it entrained six divers with them, and it went down to 250 feet. Everybody's ear burn popped, but they all came up to the surface and survived. So the reason I'm telling you this, don't do this. <laughs> it's not a good idea. So uh, just take it for granted that the stuff is happening and you know bad things can happen out there. So anyway, these are the other members of the team. Some, many of them passed already. Um, Keith Chade, DC Chade, Rick Gregg, Rick Ginther, Bob Johannes, Allison Kay, myself, Ken Roy, Stephen Smith, and, and Dick Screw, and Sid Townsley. So just want to honor their participation. These are the references. These are pretty much all low refer references, old references, because there's not much more that we can have been going on since that time. So thank you very much. Thank you.